The most widely understood word in the world is okay. The second is Coca-Cola. I don't work at all. I just stay home and enjoy Coke all the time. Coca-Cola puts you at your sparkling best. Bring home the Coke. The Coca-Cola company is huge. They sell 2.2 billion servings of their drinks every day. A meaningful percentage of all beverages humans consume on a daily basis is owned by one company. To give you a sense of scale, the Coca-Cola company's revenues from its 200 beverage brands is twice the size of PepsiCo's revenue. But more than half of Pepsi's revenue comes from salty snacks and treats. On beverages, the Coca-Cola company is four times the scale of its nearest competitor. The company has distribution in basically every country besides North Korea and Cuba, and a portfolio of brands in every major beverage category. Or to put it more simply, Coca-Cola has a dominant share of your throat. And in today's video, you'll learn why Coca-Cola was initially sold in pharmacies why Warren Buffett continues to buy more shares, and how they've spent tens of billions of dollars to get the world to drink their secret sugar water recipe. I drink probably five 12 ounce Cokes a day, and that's about 700 calories. And uh, I've been doing it more or less all my life. I can't imagine anybody that feels better than I do. When it comes to the most powerful companies on the planet, the Coca-Cola company has an enormous head start. It was invented 137 years ago. Back in 1886, a chemist named John Pemberton, based in Atlanta, Georgia, was working on breaking into the market of patent medicines. The unregulated market for medicinal beverages was booming, and Pemberton's personal favorite, Vin Mariani, included an ample dose of wine and cocaine. Pemberton created a drink with coca leaf extract. That's where the cocaine comes from. And cola nut for caffeine, along with sugar and carbonated water. His bookkeeper helped him name it Coca-Cola. Pemberton's drink hit harder than a late 2000s Four loco, but at the time was a commoditized product. There were tons of brain tonics and elixirs with highly addictive substances in their recipes, including Pepsi-Cola, which was formulated seven years later. But Pemberton couldn't turn it into a strong business. He died in 1888, selling the company to Asa Candler for a few thousand dollars shortly before passing. Candler bought out the rest of the shareholders too, possibly forging some documents along the way. And it's because of Candler that this bottle means anything to you. He was similar to Ray Kroc, who bought out the McDonald brothers from their fast food franchise and set the stage for one of the world's largest consumer brands. Candler went all out on advertising. And this is the key to the soda business, because like I said earlier, this is a commoditized product. When all the inputs for your product are commodities, that's both a problem and an opportunity. The problem is that you have lots of competitors. These days, anyone can write blog posts with AI or drop ship products from Alibaba. Back in the day, it wasn't that hard to mix together some sugar, carbonated water, and flavoring. But the commoditized product is also an opportunity. Since your inputs are commodities, there's lots of ways to get sugar and water. Your suppliers don't have pricing power. You can just go down the street and get your sugar somewhere else. So if you can effectively build a brand on top of your commodity inputs, you can make a lot of money. That's what Asa Candler did. He started off by going to as many pharmacies as he could and offering their patients a free coupon for Coca-Cola. It was the perfect market. These customers already had ailments and were already willing to spend money on cures. Throw in that this is an addictive substance, and this isn't that much different than the Sackler family pushing offices on rural America in the 2000s. Revenue started to climb quickly, but the market for sick people had two problems. Sick people don't live as long, and there's a bunch of people walking around still not drinking Coke. 
Candler never figured this part out. He actually left Coca-Cola to become the mayor of Atlanta. And it was the next batch of executives that need to figure out how to turn his drink into an enjoyable beverage for everyone. It wasn't until 1929 that Coca-Cola effectively removed the cocaine from the coca leaves it used to produce its beverage. Now that's the same year as the Great Depression. 1929, the financial house of cards collapses and the overinflated stock market plunges into a Great Depression. Correlation or causation? I'll leave that to you to decide. But through the Depression, Coca-Cola remained a relatively cheap luxury that people would indulge in to get them through the hard times. And with the cocaine removed, the beverage company began to target children in what executives called a cradle-to-grave strategy. Hook them young, and they'll be smokers, sorry, Coca-Cola drinkers for life. In the 1930s, Coca-Cola began to use Santa Claus in their advertising with artwork created by Haddon Sunbloom. These ads portrayed Santa as a jolly, red-suited figure, which was a departure from the more stern and judgmental posture that he'd occupied historically. The campaign was so culturally significant that it changed the conventional image of Santa people held in their minds. Previously, depictions showed Santa in green and not particularly chubby. The 30s were also the decade that Coca-Cola began to lean into celebrity endorsements. It started with Clark Gable. By the 50s, they were working with Elvis and Marilyn Monroe. The goal was to associate soda with youth, glamour, and status. This was pioneering at the time, and because it was relatively new, it was extremely effective. It also laid the groundwork for today's phenomenon of celebrities having their own brands. Coca-Cola continued to push the cutting edge of marketing into the middle of the century. In the 1960s, Coca-Cola established an internal data team. This was a period when data-driven decision-making in marketing was still in its infancy. They paired sales data with marketing metrics to evaluate the relative effectiveness of all their different advertising campaigns. By analyzing, the team could determine which campaigns were resonating with consumers and driving sales. Now, this seems super obvious today, but just imagine how manual this process was before the internet and cheap computing. It required a sizable investment. But that investment allowed Coca-Cola to make informed choices about media buying, product development, and how to target different segments of the market. The data also told them that product placements were very effective. In 1982, Coca-Cola acquired Columbia Pictures to vertically integrate their products and marketing insights into the entertainment business. They followed the acquisition up with the creation of TriStar Pictures, a joint venture with CBS and HBO. This led to Cokes showing up in some of the most iconic movies of the next two decades, Ghostbusters and Karate Kid in the mid 80s. Then Jerry Maguire and Men in Black in the 90s. They eventually sold the studio to Sony, but it's hard to argue with the cultural relevance that they earned through those efforts. All right, so as we were recording, I found out that Hannah had never had a Coke before, so we are gonna have her taste test it while I do this ad read. Cheers. Video is the most powerful medium for marketing. Interesting. In addition to getting millions of views on YouTube, I've also helped hundreds of B2B companies grow with video. I can see why people get addicted to this. And I made a free email-based course that you can take to jumpstart your skills. Yeah. <laughs> so go click the link in the description to sign up. It is completely free. Back to the video. Buffett loves great brands because they make great profits. I like wonderful brands. You got to take care of them. And uh, if you take care of a, of a great brand, you know, it's forever. Coca-Cola had cracked the code on selling enormous volumes of sugar water at a high margin. The fur has consistently held 60% gross margins for decades. That means in order to sell $1 worth of Coca-Cola, it costs just 40 cents of manufacturing and distribution. 
a meaningful percentage of the remaining 60% will go to marketing and other associated costs of running a business like legal administration and other such things. But they also make enormous cash flow and issue dividends to their shareholders. And at scale, all this stuff gets way better. Coca-Cola has moved most of its manufacturing to low-cost countries like Guatemala, Indonesia, and India. It's the largest buyer of sugar on the planet, which means it can procure a relatively cheap commodity at even lower prices because of its buying power. But there was a problem and an opportunity that necessitated an evolution of the Coca-Cola company. In the 60s and 70s, as they were doing their data analysis of marketing trends, scientific research began to uncover their data linking excessive sugar consumption to health issues. This came to the head with the publication of a book, Pure, White, and Deadly, by British nutritionist John Yudkin in 1972. The book argued high consumption of sugar was linked to heart disease and diabetes. Coca-Cola chose not to focus on denying the claims and effectively Streisand effect fear of sugar into the masses. Instead, they saw this as an opportunity to expand the market in which they played. Soda was a large market, and if you have a large share of a large market, you're gonna make a lot of money. But you know what's bigger than the soda market? The entire market for beverages. Today, Coca-Cola has the largest share of the beverage market of any company in the world. It does four times the revenue that PepsiCo musters. It dwarfs the drink brands contained within Nestle or Unilever. Keurig Dr. Pepper is 50% a competitor. They also do a lot of coffee, but they're dwarfed in, in size. They're a tenth the size of Coca-Cola. And while the success of Coca-Cola and its derivatives like Diet Coke and Coke Zero make up the linchpin of this advantage, the company has also been an aggressive acquirer of brands in an effort to diversify across the beverage industry. It started in 1960 with the acquisition of Minute Maid, which was a leader in juices and also included the High C brand. Simultaneously, Coca-Cola launched the Fanta brand that same year. In the 1980s, they launched Powerade to compete with the success of Gatorade in the new sports drink segment. They lagged for decades and were eventually passed by Body Armor, which they acquired in 2021 for $5.6 billion. They acquired Barks Root Beer in 1995 and the non-US rights to Cadbury Schweppes in 1999. They also launched the Dasani water brand in 1999. Since the turn of the century, they've acquired Golden Peak Tea, Vitamin Water, Smart Water, Honest Tea, Topo Chico, Fairlife Milk, and Costa Coffee. They also launch the Simply Juice brand. All of these brands blow up after acquisition because Coca-Cola has the best distribution network of any consumer goods company. They have 30 million customers. That's not people buying drinks. That's 30 million retailers who buy Coca-Cola products and sell it to their customers. But by 2020, their portfolio had ballooned to over 500 brands. And as any good bodybuilder knows, sometimes you need to bulk and other times you need to cut. It would be impossible to have 500 beverage brands and not have some redundancies in your portfolio. Further, such a large lineup makes it really functionally difficult to focus your efforts, even at a $100 billion company. So in mid-2020, the company announced it would cut its portfolio of brands in half. It discontinued Tab, Zico Coconut Water, and Odwalla. Same with two regional drinks, Virginia's Great Neck Northern Ale and Delaware Punch. Honest Tea was sold in order to double down on the Golden Peak brand. The vision was for the Coca-Cola company to double down on its winners and eliminate any brand without the potential to do at least $1 billion in revenue. But this wasn't the only financial engineering that the company had recently undergone. They also spun out their bottling operations into separate companies. Historically, Coca-Cola has gone through periods of owning bottling operations and franchising the process out to partners. And it kind of makes sense. Building brands is a marketing intensive process, and it must remain Coca-Cola's core competency at all costs. Bottling the recipe is a scaled manufacturing process coupled with logistics. It's a different circle of competence 
and it's also less capital efficient. When the Coca-Cola company funnels money into marketing, it has a relatively high ROI on capital invested. But building and maintaining a manufacturing and distribution network requires much more capital to operate. Facilities, trucks, and an HR function chew up money. Bottling is also a local business, so the Coca-Cola company normally partners with a large family shareholder. These businesses are tapped for their local go-to-market knowledge, local innovation around the brands, and a greater understanding of excise requirements, changes in the retail landscape, changes in regulation, and changes in consumer taste. But since Coca-Cola usually still owns around 20% of these bottling assets and sits on their board, they can take in information about what's happening on the ground and use it to inform their international operations. They learn from the best bottlers in certain regions, take that skill set, and transfer it elsewhere. Spinning out bottle operations also has one more cynical advantage. Across the globe, Coca Cola has run into legal issues. In Colombia, bottling facility workers tried to unionize. When efforts were made to intimidate organizers, that reflected poorly on the Coca Cola brand. When the same thing happened in Guatemala, it now became a pattern of corporate behavior associated with the world's largest beverage company. But now, if a local bottling company is accused of buying politicians or stifling unionization efforts, Coca-Cola can throw up its hands and say, that's not us. We don't know what's going on on the ground with our partners. We just market sugar water, guys. But the crazy thing is that despite their size, all the things we covered, the Coca-Cola company is still growing. Coca-Cola outspends Pepsi on a marketing basis of three to one. And if you exclude their snacks, that climbs to four times or more. The entire Coca-Cola system sales are north of $150 billion. Yet year after year, decade after decade, it still accomplishes consistent single digit growth rates. And crazy enough, you can still point to growth opportunities on the horizon. The world's leading beverage company is still only dipping its toes in the alcohol segment. They've begun partnerships to produce cans of Jack and Coke. Next up will be Absolute Vodka and Sprite. The biggest risk might be Ozempic. If semaglutide can help people lose weight by kicking their sugar cravings, it would devastate the Coca-Cola portfolio. Maybe we'll explore that in a future video. But unless that tail event becomes a reality, then the Coca-Cola company will remain one of the greatest compounders in business history. Thanks for watching.